morning and welcome from the Senior Law Day Collaborative. My name is Melinda Bellis and I'm an attorney in charge at Legal Services of the Hudson Valley. I'm also a co-chair of the Senior Law Day Collaborative. I share this role with Elena Falcone from the Westchester Library System and Sarah Steckler of Washer Burstein. And we are also ably assisted today by Bruce Siegel of Marketing Sense. You've joined us today for a primer on senior living options, and we'll do that in just a few moments. But first, let me tell you a little bit about the collaborative and the resources available to you. The collaborative is composed of more than 150 professionals who are all eager to bring authoritative information on legal, financial, and health topics to our county's older adults. We make available educational workshops throughout the year, as well as brief one-on-one -on -one consultations with collaborative professionals. You can connect with our resources and services through our website, seniorlawday.info. The site is a resource for information on legal and financial topics addressed by the collaborative. In fact, you can go there to watch the video recordings of prior webinars, access printed reference materials, such as our annual updated elder law Q&A, and sends us your questions on any topic of concern to older adults. Just look for the Ask Us button on the site. Send us your contact information and a rough outline of your question, and we'll work promptly to connect you with the needed expertise. And now a few points about the format in which we're working today. This Zoom video conferencing event is being recorded with the aim of posting the recording to the Senior Law Day site. You as participants are muted. However, you can ask questions via the Q&A box on the bottom of your Zoom window. We may not be able to answer all questions that are posted, but unless you choose to ask anonymously, we will work to follow up via email. You could also save your question for that Ask Us button on the seniorlawday.info website. Now I will turn this presentation over to today's presenter, Gemma Maver, who is the Director of Sales for River Spring Living and has been in the senior living industry for 20 years. Gemma. Thank you very much, Melinda. Thank you for that introduction. Good morning, everyone. Um, I'm very happy to be here today to share uh, the various options in um, senior living that um, is in the marketplace. Uh, as a consumer, it can be a little bit confusing because there are so many different models, uh, but we will, um, we will walk through those today for you. So Bruce, if you could put up the presentation. So there are, very, there are many options for, for people as we age. Um, and so the next slide, please, we'll, we'll talk about those options. Um, staying at home, I know many of us want to stay at home for as long as we can, um, and as we age, we can bring in supportive services at home. Uh, there's also natural occurring retirement communities, or known as NORCs. Um, you become a member of a NORC, it's, it's based um, in your community, and it provides services that the community provides, such as spiritual, social, educational, um, as well as vetting services for people who come into your home to do repairs, pet care, et cetera. So we'll go into that a little bit more. There's also home care for people who want to stay at home but have needs that need to be taken care of, meal preparation or getting help in the morning and medication reminders. Uh, there are 55 plus adult active communities. These are mostly communities that have an age um, bracket, you have to be 55 plus to live there. They're usually um, condo complexes or rentals where, where people reside. And then we get into more of the communities, uh, independent living, assisted living, dementia care. Um, there's also a Medicaid program called assisted living program. And then of course, nursing home. So the next, next slide, please. So staying at home, how do we plan? We all know that as we age, our physical needs will change and assistance may be required. So for those of us who would like to stay at home, we have to have a plan in place. Um, if, if we're living with their spouse or a partner and that person needs care or you need care, 
um, you're going to have to bring in services at home. Um, managing a home is very difficult as well. For those of you who live in an apartment building or a private house that has stairs, that's always difficult to navigate as we get old. We also have to arrange for transportation, for to go to social events, doctor's appointments, uh, uh, shopping. Uh, as we get older, many of us give up driving and give up our cars. Uh, socialization is a very big component of our lifestyle. And, and I find that people who stay at home um, do become isolated. And the exception, of course, this, these past few years with COVID, so many of us, despite our ages, uh, were home um, and we had a lockdown. We weren't able to go out to restaurants, to travel, to see our family and friends, uh, to go to work. So as we, as we get older, that socialization is a major component of, of what we wanna do with our lives. And of course, if you have care coming in, you have to manage that. Uh, many adult children that I work with um, say that it's, it's very stressful for them to, to manage their own families as well as having aging parents. So all of those things that um, are the components of staying home is, is part of your planning process of, do you wanna stay in a house? that is large and has a lot of you know, maintenance to take care of? Uh, do you have a, a home where you have stairs, either it's an apartment building or a private home? Uh, what to do with transportation? Uh, many of us who live outside of New York City, transportation, as you know, public transportation is limited. Um, so we have to really think about, if we stay at home, what's our plan and, and how do we go about moving forward with that? Uh, national, national natural, sorry, occurring retirement communities are really, um, it, it's a grassroots um, organization and they do coordinate a broad range of health and social services to help support older adults stay in their homes. Uh, a NORC program is to feel, facilitate and really integrate what's in the community as far as health services, maintenance services, social services, religious services, to help those folks stay at home. Um, some of the uh, services that they provide uh, would be, they could uh, give you a list of transportation, whether it's uh, excessive ride or, or transportation that's provided by your, your county or your village or town. Uh, they'll give you a list of vetted handyman services. So you know that if you need to call a plumber or a painter that these folks have been vetted and they come recommended by the NORC. Uh, if you have a pet and you need some help with pet care, there are people who do that. Um, home, home meals uh, or Meals on Wheels, services like that, uh, religious services and social services within the community. So how a NORC really works is, uh, this is by membership. Some NORCs only ask what you could afford to pay for membership. It's very limited membership. Sometimes it's $25 a year or $50 a year. And they will either... They'll provide some of these services. The NORC that I'm familiar with here, we're in Westchester County in Sleepy Hollow in Tarrytown. It's called uh, ITAV. It takes a village 10591, which is our zip code. They have a list, they have uh, um, volunteer drivers who will help um, assist people with taking them to doctor's appointments or uh, the hair salon or shopping. Um, and then they have a list of services that they vetted. You pay for these services um, other than the volunteer drivers, but if a handyman comes, then you pay for those services, but at least you know you have someone who's been vetted and who comes recommended, and you're not just calling somebody from um, the yellow pages. So a NORC really tries to uh, have an umbrella um, platform of services for people who want to stay at home, and they really put you in touch with what the village or county is offering as well. Um, as far as social or religious or, or um, uh, services that you bring in, um, home care. So it's really part of a membership and you, you can tap into their resources for what you need to stay at home and to stay at home safely. Um, we did, a, a, I'm curious to ask the audience of, you know, where you live. Uh, do you live in Westchester County? Do you live maybe in the Northern Bronx um, or, or Rockland County? Do you live in a home? Do you live in an apartment? Do you rent? Do you own? I'm curious to see what our, um, 
our audience um, where you live and where you live now? Or do you live in a senior living community? And are you a member of a NORC in your, within your community of, of, of where you're living? Okay. So then, Live in own, okay, so I'm getting, uh, thank you, Daisy, for your um, response. You live in a co-op in, in Yonkers. Okay. So we can go to the, so we say, we see that 7% uh, of our audience uh, rent, 87%, uh, wow, own a home or an apartment. 7% um, live in a senior living community. And I don't see anyone who's a member of a NORC from our audience right now. Okay, thank you. So the next slide, please. Home care. So if, if, as our needs change, home care provides um, home health aides to come into your home to provide assistance with what we say are activities with daily living, such as if you need help getting in the shower, um, getting up in the morning uh, with uh, getting dressed, just getting started. Um, they can, uh, AIDS, home health aides can remind you to take your meds and when you take them, your medications, but they are not allowed to pour those medications. So you can have a family member set up a pillbox for you or a registered nurse would come in to do that. Um, just keep in mind that home care services are privately paid. Um, for those of you, uh, it would be interested to see if any of, of you have long-term care insurance. Now, this is not Medicare and supplemental. Just to be clear, Medicare is your medical insurance that covers your hospitalizations, your doctors, your tests. Um, and supplemental pays for the 20% of what Medicare does not pay for. Medicare usually covers 80% and your supplemental covers 20%. But when you're living in a, in a place, whether it's a, a home and you bring in services or assisted living, these are all private pay options. And we'll talk about long-term care in a moment. I'd be interested to see how many of you do have long-term care insurance. Emma, excuse me one moment. We have a question. Um, there, there's a question asking if we have a list of NORCs in Westchester. Um, I'm sure if you go on national current, natural recurring retirement communities and just put a zip code in, they could help you. Also, the Senior Department of Programs and Services, um, I believe it's based out of White Plains. I'm sure they have a list of NORCs in, in, in the area. Thank you. Okay. Um, I know of two in Westchester. If you live in the Sleepy Hollow, Tarrytown, it's called ITAV, I-T-A-V. It's an acronym for It Takes a Village, 10591. And then there is one in Mount Vernon, Bronxville area. That, that I know. So home care, there are two types of agencies for home care. One is called a licensed home care agency or a LICSA, and they provide home health aides. These are trained certified home health aides that can help with, with hands-on assistance, helping you get in a shower, uh, preparing a meal for you, um, helping you get dressed, uh, taking you to doctors or grocery shopping or errands. Um, a certified home health agency or a CHA is really providing nursing care for medical needs, wound care, pouring medications. These, these um, care levels have to be done by a registered nurse. So there are two agencies, depending on, on what your needs may be, that you can, you can hire to come in. And there are many, many uh, home care agencies throughout Westchester County. Uh, you probably know of one, Visiting Nurse Services of New York. They have both of these types of agencies because they're licensed differently because they provide different services. Next Excuse slide, please. Me. Yes. Um, just going back to the question about NORCs in Westchester, uh, we have a comment that there is a NORC in Yonkers run by Sally Pinto. Okay. And there is a NORC in Riverdale, New York. I don't know if it covers Southern Yonkers. I just thought of this. Um, called Amal Amalgamated. It is in Riverdale, New York. Long-term care insurance. So long-term care insurance is private insurance that you pay for. 
Um, and it does help pay for home care services, assisted living community, nursing home. Um, so how it works is you purchase an amount of money for a period of time. So let's say you purchase coverage of $300,000 over a five-year period, and you pay premiums on that long-term care insurance. Um, and so what happens is uh, the older you get, the more expensive the insurance is, and insurance is uh, vet you. So if you have any precondition, preconditions, medical conditions, they could turn you down. Um, this, is, this is separate from your medical insurance. So long-term care does help pay for some of those services. It works in this way. They will pay you a daily benefit out of that chunk of money that you purchase, $300,000 in coverage, and they will pay up to two, three, four hundred dollars a day of what your needs are. If you need 12-hour care at home, if you just need two hours at home, uh, they will pay up to a certain amount. And the insurance companies do send a nurse to evaluate you. And usually you need help with at least two ADLs to qualify to collect on your insurance. Either it's dressing, bathing, medication management, meals, transferring, helping you know get from a sitting to a standing position. And so I'd be curious to see how many folks do have long-term care insurance. Um, and it's, it's only for a period of time. And once you've exhausted those benefits, you've spent that $300,000, then the, the, the um, coverage ends. So long-term care is, it's not an inexpensive proposition. On average, people can pay from three to $10,000 a year for premiums. Once you activate the insurance, once you start using it, then the premiums are dropped. You no longer have to pay for those premiums. Uh, interesting uh, tidbit about long-term care. This, this product came out probably maybe 30, 40 years ago in the marketplace. And actuarially, the insurance companies, they messed up. Uh, they didn't expect us to live as long as we have with medications and therapies. So a lot of the insurance companies, the big insurance companies, John Hancock, um, um, uh, Conesco, which was in Florida, now it's owned by another company, they pulled out of the market. They were no longer, in off, no longer offering long-term care to new policyholders, but they had to... Um, honor the current policyholders. Uh, insurance is, a, is a, um, a regulated industry in New York State. It's regulated by the Department of uh, Financial Services. Um, and so they, by law, if you have a policy with John Hancock, for example, that you bought 10, 20 years ago, that policy still stays in effect. But John Hancock is no longer offering these policies because they started to lose money because people were living longer and they didn't expect people to use as much long-term care as they have. Um, excuse me, we have a question asking if you have any recommendations for what firms you like for long-term care policies. You know, the marketplace has changed. Um, I would consult with a long-term care insurance agent. Um, they can shop for you. They can show you different uh, models, different pricing, different purchase plans. Uh, personally, I bought uh, one for myself 12 years ago, and I use um, a long-term care uh, agent or broker that specializes in this insurance. And she showed me four or five different plans, and we came up with the best plan for what I needed, what I thought, you know, for my future, what I would need. Um, so... I would suggest contacting a long-term care insurance broker or someone who specializes in this, in this insurance. People who sell car insurance and homeowners insurance are not versed in this particular insurance. That's a different specialty. So that's what I would recommend. You can always call companies, but a lot, a lot of the companies, John Hancock is no longer offering long-term care insurance. New York Life is no, no longer offering long-term care. But there are some smaller companies that, that may be able to do that. Thank you. Next slide, please. So we're going to get into the different senior living options. Uh, 55 plus adult active communities. There aren't too many in the New York City area. Uh, there may be a couple of apartment buildings uh, that have uh, you know, people who 
only who are over 60 or 55 plus can live there. Um, they're mostly in the suburbs. I've seen them in New Jersey, Westchester County, Long Island. They usually are apartment or condo complexes. Um, they provide limited amenities. Um, they may provide a local van service to take people on errands on a weekly basis. They usually have some um, sports activities, a pool, a clubhouse, a golf course, tennis courts. Um, they don't provide any meals or um, uh, home care. Uh, they're basically communities that are for people who want to be with their, among their peers. They, they don't want to live next to young families or uh, single folks coming in. It's really for people who want to live among their peers and want to um, take advantage of the amenities that they provide. Um, they're very, socially, they, they, they're very uh, popular among people who are in their 50s and 60s because they are with people who have the same interests and are the same age. Um, and usually it's, it's a buy-in. You, you buy the condo like you would a home or an apartment or you would rent or own. Um, so those are 55, they're called 55 adult active communities. Uh, next slide, please. Um, and then there are the independent living. These are communities um, like the club at Briarcliff, for example, or the River Walk at River Spring Living. And you rent an apartment um, and you have, you have benefits. The benefits are you're socializing with your peers. There are learning opportunities through their activities and lecture series. It's maintenance free. You just call the building supervisor and he or she will come up to take care of whatever needs to be fixed. You have a full support staff there. You have an administrative staff, you have dining, you have facilities, you have housekeeping. And usually it's an all-inclusive cost. Um, and I'll go into that a little bit more. The amenities they provide, there's a dining program. Many times uh, these independent communities offer one to three meals a day that's included in your monthly fee served in a dining room. They have wellness programs. Many of them have gyms um, and uh, pools. Uh, they provide housekeeping and personal laundry services, transportation within usually a 10 or 15 mile radius of where the community is located. They have a 24 hour security and concierge service. And this is independent living is really for people who are independent, but they wanna sell their homes. They wanna be in a more social setting. They want to have amenities. They're tired of cooking. They don't want to do their laundry anymore. Uh, so these communities are quite beneficial. The price runs from anywhere from $2,500 up. Um, most utilities are also included in this. Um, additionally, it may be phone, cable, and Wi-Fi, but heat and hot water, electric are usually included. Um, so many people come into these communities because they've sold a home. They have those assets and those proceeds, and they, they want to live in a carefree community. Um, I work in this industry, so during COVID, you know, a lot of these communities weren't allowing people to move in because they were locked down like the rest of the world. However, um, now we're seeing a, a flood of people coming into these communities because they know what it was like being so isolated at home during COVID. Um, on top of as you know, aging and, and being at home more, more and more and being retired. So there are a lot of benefits to, to, to being in a community, um, as I stated. Assisted living communities and many independent living communities have an assisted living uh, component. It's maybe a separate building or separate floor or separate neighborhood. Um, assisted living really provides assistance with those daily living activities or ADLs as we call them. Uh, all meals are provided, medication management, help getting dressed, transferring. If you have chronic mobility issues, many assisted living communities also offer um, infusion therapies. Um, and these are really, these are communities where people need a little extra help. They need a, they need a little bit more support. Uh, you have a full staff of people, clinical staff. Usually these communities are overseen by a, a nurse manager and a physician comes in, not every day, but a, once a week, twice a week. So you could see a physician, he can 
you know, if you're not feeling well, he or she can see you, can write prescriptions for you, can renew prescriptions. They offer a, a tremendous um, amount of social activities and trips and lectures and wellness programs. Um, they have social programs that are designed based on, on individual needs. So if you're coming in, if your mom and dad are coming in, you know, share with them, tell them what, what mom and dad like or what you'd like to do. And the activities director will most likely design a program that fits the current resident population as to what their needs are and what their interests are. The accommodations in assisted living are usually studios or one bedroom apartments with kitchenettes. They don't have full kitchens because all of the meals are provided. Um, the cost for assisted living in Westchester County probably starts around $6,500 a month. It can increase from that. And there's usually in addition a care level, depending on how much care you will need. Somebody who is wheelchair bound uh, may need more care. So the higher level of care, usually it's a tiered care program. So you have a base rate of the, of the rent for the accommodation, for the apartment you choose, and then a care level in addition to that based on your care needs. Um, every resident who comes in would be evaluated by their clinical team to determine how much care you need. Again, this is where long-term care can help benefit and offset the cost of this. It may not pay for it in full, was based on how much you know dollars you bought at the time you purchased that policy, but these these um, these are mostly private pay um, programs. Uh, assisted living communities also have another component, another um, area of care, and that would be for dementia or as we call memory support people who have dementia. These are uh, services and programs designed for those people with those special needs, providing a safe and caring environment. Um, so you'll have many times in an assisted living building, you'll have certain uh, sections or floors that are dedicated to those people with dementia because they have very different needs than someone who just needs help with their ADLs. Uh, so there is care uh, for people who have dementia, and most communities have uh, programs for early to mid-stage dementia, and then programs for more advanced dementia. Um, most of these programs are in a secure environment, meaning that some residents have the capability of, of wandering. So there are codes that the staff have, the family have to keep these people safe at the doors and the elevators um, so that people can stay in a safe environment. And um, most um, uh, memory support programs um, have outdoor space for residents in a secure environment. So they can be outdoors, they can garden, they can see with their families. They're just not locked in, so to speak, in an indoor environment. Um, so they're, they're, they're real specially designed with a care that has been given by, by staff who have been trained in dementia care. Um, so those are the programs for um, what you call memory support or dementia care assisted living. We have a question concerning assisted living, um, not memory. The staff speak of Medicaid as being important. Could you please comment on this? So traditionally, assisted living is private pay. The next slide here, assisted living program is what's called an ALP, or uh, this is a Medicaid supported program. Um, it's a different license by the State Department of Health. So if you're if you run an assisted living or a nursing home or a home care agency, you have to be licensed by the Department of Health. The Department of Health gives you a license that and and dictates, you know, the care that you can provide. So an assisted living program, there there are very few in the state um, because the state allots a certain amount of beds um, throughout the state for this program or rooms. It's for people who are on Medicaid. Most ALPs are really designed for people who are pretty much independent. They don't give the amount of care because it's a different license that a traditional private pay assisted living would, would give you. So they, they could help with intermittent, if you needed intermittent help with getting dressed or bathing, but not, not on a consistent basis. Um, they do provide all meals. They do provide medication management. 
activities, trips, housekeeping, and laundry. They, they provide all of that. Most of them are private rooms. They're not apartments. Um, they're like a dormitory move with a private, with a private uh, bathroom. Um, and it's for people who are on community Medicaid. And Medicaid pays for most of this. Um, there is an out-of-pocket expense to the resident of about $1,250 a month. Um, and that would come from your social security or your um, pension. If you did not meet the threshold with income, then the community would apply for additional Medicaid for you to meet that threshold. Uh, Medicaid also says that you as a resident have to have pocket money each month of $250. So that's calculated into the, the, the out-of-pocket costs of the 1250 that you can get additional Medicaid for if your income doesn't meet that threshold. That would include the $250 of your spending money. So there are assisted living programs. Um, River Spring Living has one. Um, there is one in, in Yonkers. Uh, I don't recall the name. Um, there's one in the city. It, it's called Vista on 5th. Um, on 105th Street and 5th Avenue. So there are a few. Most of them have very long waiting lists um, and some do have availability because they are, they're limited. There aren't too many in the state of New York. Nursing home. Um, so this is probably the highest level of care that one can receive being in a community. Um, it's both short-term and long-term care. So short-term, if um, and Medicare would pay for. So for example, if you had a hospital stay and you need to be in the hospital, this is a Medicare rule for three days or more it, being admitted. And let's say you've had a knee replaced or you've broken a hip or you've had a bout of pneumonia and your doctor is re requiring you to be discharged with subacute rehab. Medicare will pay for your rehab in full up to 20 days. Above the 20 days, Medicare pays about 80%, and then your supplemental insurance kicks in the remaining 20%. Um, so that will take you from the 21st day up to the 100th day. Um, so after that, then you, you pay privately. But if you have plateaued in your um, rehab, let's say you plateaued after eight days or 32 days, then that's judged by the physical therapists and the people at the rehab center, and then you're discharged home. Um, Long-term care for those residents who really need 24-hour skilled nursing home care. Um, and usually that is done on a private pay basis or Medicaid will pay for you. But just keep in mind, Medicare is a, is a short-term um, uh, reimbursement for subacute rehab. And the next slide, please. These are just some resources as we're coming to the end of the presentation. A leadingage.org, there's also leadingageny.org is an organization, it's an advocacy group that represents senior living communities. Great resources, great articles on their website. And then AARP has a wonderful website about um, uh, caregiving resource center and staying at home and some of the challenges and where you can look for um, some supportive help. Uh, but these are good resources just to go on their websites just to look at. Uh, Leading Age also deals with um, the uh, government and you know what's going on with um, issues relating to seniors and Medicare. So there's some very good articles about um, about this um, about the senior environment and how it affects state and local governments as well as what's going on in Washington. So I'm gonna open it up to questions. I think that that ends the, um, the overall view. This is Senior Living 101. I know it, it's, uh, I gave you a lot of information, but um, there's, there's a lot of resources out there where you can, you can um, get additional information. Yes, thank you so much for that. It was really informative. Um, there's a question, are there step-up facilities in Westchester where you start with independent living and graduate to assisted living? Yes, so um, they're usually called life plan communities. They have independent living, assisted living, memory support, and nursing home care. 
So the idea is you can age in place on the same campus. Um, and as your needs change, you can move through the continuum of care. A life plan communities, or they're known as continuing care retirement communities, or CCRCs, um, usually you have to pay an entry fee to go in. Um, it's a large chunk of money. Um, and then part of that entry fee is refunded to you or to your estate should you leave the community when you die. There's usually a 50% refund or an 80% of what you paid on an entry fee. Um, and so communities like that are Kendall on Hudson, um, the Osborne, um, and then there are different models within this, the, the, the CCRCs or life plan communities. Um, they have different refundabilities. Some do offer a zero refundable 50 or 80. If you have a zero refundable, you pay less of an entry fee. But the, the, the benefit of the CCRC is that your monthly fee stays the same throughout the continuum. So it's almost like buying an insurance product from the community. Let's say you had a one bedroom and you paid $5,000 for that one bedroom and you moved to assisted living, you still pay the 5,000. If you move to skilled nursing, you still pay the 5,000 versus the private pay. Like I said, assisted living starts at about 6,500, 7,000 a month. Nursing home uh, privately is about $14,000 a month in Westchester County. So that's the benefit of a life plan community. Thank you. We'll just wait a moment to see if there's any other questions. Oh, um, there's a question. Does life plan accept Medicaid? No, life plan is fully uh, privately paid for. Medicaid, uh, if you're on community Medicaid, you can get home services, home health aids. Um, you can find an ALP or an assisted living program um, or nursing home care. And another question, in assisted living communities, how are residents notified of increased costs? Is there any protection from increased costs? That's a very good question. Most communities, independent and assisted, do raise their monthly fees on average, average three to 4% a year. So that's a good question. When you're looking at an assisted living community, you're going to meet with a marketing person who will you know, go over the costs, show you availability, introduce you to staff, maybe meet residents. That's a good question you should ask. His, you know, historically, what have, you, what have your increases been? And what are you projecting for the next year or so? Um, assisted living and independent living uh, costs of running communities increase, and they do pass those on to, to the resident. I think that that is it for the questions. Gemma, thank you so much. This was really wonderful. And um, I believe, Bruce, you can confirm that this should be available um, on the website on like Friday. Yes, it will be available by Friday. But Melinda, we do have one more question. Oh, I missed it. Okay, got it. What about alternative long-term care insurance membership plans for three months and then off plan for three months? Can you explain? I'm not familiar with that. If you're buying a long-term care policy, um, it's, it's for the amount of time and the amount of money you purchase. Now there is a waiting period. Maybe that's what the, the person is asking the question. Um, usually there's a 90 day waiting period. So for the first three months you need care, the insurance company will not pay. There's that waiting period of 90 days. So most policies have a waiting period of average 90 days. Some offer 60, some offer 120. Um, also just wanted to jump in and say that our next webinar on December 1st is on long-term care with and without insurance. So it's possible that our speaker Keith Mukherjee may have an answer to that and other questions. So. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Bruce. Thank you, Melinda. Thank you to our, uh, our attendees this morning. Bruce, we have one more question. Uh, do you know about catastrophe insurance? I don't. That's usually an additional medical insurance. Um, I, I don't know much about that. Uh, again, you would consult uh, a medical insurance agent uh, for catastrophe. 
insurance. And if you need that, uh, you have to look at what you have currently, whether you have private insurance or Medicare, and see if you actually need catastrophe insurance, but I'm not familiar with it, no. Okay. Well, if there aren't any other questions, I'm just gonna take a moment uh, to share our website. This is where you register right on the second tab for tomorrow. This is the Ask Us button. And then I did wanna just take a moment to thank our sponsors, which are um, listed on the sponsor page of our website, attorneys, excuse me, financial planners, geriatric care managers, other, we have a foundation uh, that supports us. Um, and so without that, we couldn't uh, bring these webinars uh, to you. Anyway, uh, well, thank you very much and have a great day. Thank you again. Um, thank you, everybody. Thank you. And have a nice day, everyone. Have a nice